So, hello again, everybody. So, just I'm going to be very brief because I'm conscious people want to get uh, get home shortly. But um, this is a topic I've been asked to talk about, and I think before we talk about the future of innovation, we have to ask ourselves what we mean by innovation, because one of these very loaded terms. And I think more importantly, we've got to ask ourselves what we need to mean by innovation. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to take you on a quick tale of two. Oops, that's interesting. It hasn't worked. It says a tale of two uh, in exponentials, borrowing from uh, from Charles Dickens. It's obviously been encrypted by one of our cyber companies today. <laughs> um, so never never use an on-standard point on the slide. I keep telling people that you should listen. But we are currently in this as a species, as a nation, as a you know, you know as a people on this earth, locked in a battle between two exponentials. And of course, we all know in this very well-informed audience what an exponential is. It looks like this, of course. The first half of it, things are doubling, but it feels linear or the same. The second half, there's a bewildering rate of change that we can't process. And uh, what we think and should is going to happen is this dotted line is going to continue. And we're all caught in that kind of mentality. And then suddenly the exponential kicks into the second half, and it's all very bewildering. So, for example, there's no better case of that than the, the climate exponential that we're currently living through. Now, most of us still believe the dotted line is where we are. We, we, we still feel that. We intellectually, we know otherwise, but intuitively, we all act as if it's a dotted line. And that's partly because we're conditioned. You know, we, we don't understand exponentials as humans. Our lives are built around, they're so short that normally we experience linearity in our lives. We are the first generation or the first kind of age where we're going to get the, the privilege of enjoying non-linear life. And there's all these different vested interests that keep us in that, that mindset. But we're absolutely in this situation. And we're probably a bit here now. And we're seeing you know, more and more climate, climate disasters and uh, you know, extreme summers, etc. And that's only going to continue. So that's one, ex one example of one exponential that, that we are living through. There are others as well. And the climate exponential is built on a set of other exponentials that, that feed it. So this is the exponential age that we're living in. Now, I said there was two exponentials. The other exponential is the technology exponential, and it sort of works in the other direction. Um, it basically, certain technology become, technologies become exponentially cheaper and exponentially better uh, over time. And these exponential technologies are essentially, along with better policy making, the pretty much only tool we have to fight against these exponentials that are that are more negative and pernicious. So you know, what would be some examples of that? Well, of course, solar power is a great example. So in 1975, a, a, watt, a watt of solar power was $100. In 2019, it was a quarter of a cent, give or take. And it's projected to continue to fall by multiples over the next uh, 10 years as well. So it's gone from being totally unviable, not very effective, to being a lot cheaper than fossil fuels, uh, albeit it doesn't have the vested interests attached to it that they do, but it's a much cheaper technology now. Um, another example is the Iceland carbon capture plant. You might have heard of this. It's an experimental uh, a carbon capture plant, and it costs you know many, many, tens of millions to build. It processes 4,000 tonnes of carbon a year. Last year, we produced 36.3 billion tonnes of carbon. So that very much sits here in the currently completely non-viable category. But it, as an exponential technology, potentially, it's going to come down that curve and is a contributor technology to keeping life on this planet beyond your children's children. So we find ourselves surrounded by these non-viable technologies that are starting to become viable. So I don't know if you track uh, fusion very much. Maybe we've got some fusion scientists in today, maybe not. But in you know, all my lifetime, I'm sure, and of course all of yours, it's been 30 years away. It's been a sort of never coming technology. But now, because of advances in magnetic materials, because of the enormous compute power we have to model fields, etc., there are multiple startups working seriously on near term fusion solutions. And the proxy for the credibility of that is there are billions of dollars of VC money going into fusion right now. And it, VC money it isn't actually risk capital. VCs do not like risk. They come into an industry when it's a lot safer. 
So the fact that that money is coming in there tells us that we're starting to move down that exponential in a way that we never have before. So what drives that uh, exponential technology? What is an exponential technology? Well, of course, one driving factor we're all pretty familiar with is Moore's Law. You know, there's different ways of saying Moore's Law. It's not really a law. It's a, it's a kind of guideline, a target. But essentially, every 18 to 24 months, we double uh, the chip power for the same cost. And you know, this graph's quite striking. You can look at that, how that doubling was, you know, at this scale, insignificant until the early 2000s, and it's really rocketed up because of that constant ability to double processing power over time. So that's allowed us to do things we couldn't do before, to model things we couldn't model, to calculate things, to create new products. It's a very, very uh, powerful force in driving exponential technologies. That's the one we all know about. The one that people know less about is this one, which is a Wright's Law. I don't know if anyone's heard of Wright's Law. This, this is named after Theodore Wright, who was an aircraft airframe engineer, not, not related to the Wright brothers who came before him. And he noticed that for every doubling of output, um, essentially, we, were, we basically we could cause the cost to fall by a constant percentage. So that's another exponential effect. Now, that's very, very profound because it means that the more we make something, the better we get at it. It really drives us down that exponential. So Wright's Law combined with Moore's Law is essentially underpinnings of exponential technologies. And when you start combining exponential technology, you, you accelerate that exponential even more. So we do have the nonlinear tools to potentially, with a gr greater awakening of the crisis we're in, um, to battle that crisis. We do have those tools. And so therefore, you know, if you look at an example of Wright's Law uh, in, in action, if you take like a windmill, for example, and you double its, its blade size, and because of pi r squared, you essentially quadruple its power output. So it's an example of how getting better at manufacturing something makes it more uh, significantly, at least geometrically, more powerful. So here we are. We've got these two uh, exponentials that are squaring off against each other. I'm using climate as an example, but there are other exponentials that we, that we face. And the question is, who wins out of this race? And it is a race. So for example, in the case of climate, we get to a certain point in that curve, and climate change is irreversible. So there will come a point where the permafrost melting in Siberia will release so much methane, which will cause more melting. We just can't control that. After a certain scale, we're, we're, we're done for. So there's, a, there's a, a kind of threshold. We don't have forever to sort this out. And on the other hand, what you find with exponential technologies is that when you get to a certain price point, 90% adoption suddenly starts to kick in for the right technologies. So we've got to get to the green line before we get to the red line. And that means that, that our challenge in innovation is not just to invent, it's to get to scale quickly so that rights law kicks in, because that moves this green dot to the, the left, which means that we uh, uh, tackle these issues and address them before the red line gets too far, the red dot gets too far up to the threshold. So that's essentially our our unspoken competition that's now enacting every day and every year around us. And there's lots of these exponentials at work. This is, this is um, beef production. Now, beef is an extraordinarily high producer of, of methane and carbon dioxide. And uh, it's, it's effectively, empirically, exponentially increasing. So you know, there's, there's so many different areas where we need to bring new approaches, new technologies, and scale them as quickly as we possibly can, um, because this is the battle that we're facing. So when we come to the question of what do we mean by innovation, then let's start by looking at what we don't mean by it. Innovation is not research. And this is a mistake that many universities make. Uh, I suspect not this one, because we're having this symposium today, and that's super encouraging. But a lot, of, a lot of people talk about innovation as research. And we're extraordinarily complacent in this country about our universities. One of the best university sectors in the world with all the research. Innovation is much more than that. Innovation is taking uh, research into product or services and then scaling them to the point where they're actually impactful. And universities have a very large responsibility here because the, the things that are going to address the exponentials we face are not consumer tech. You know, it's not a, another sky scanner or another social media platform. It's deep tech. 
and that predominantly is born in environments like this. So you have a very special responsibility and that starts with defining what innovation really means. Now, what does it mean beyond that? Well, innovation is not just about, you know, sitting in labs and so on. A big part of it is entrepreneurship. It's being really good at taking ideas into the market. We've heard some great examples today from you know, many speakers about how that, that can be done. But we have to embrace that universities, for example, need to be entrepreneurial hotbeds. We need to be teaching entrepreneurialism. We need to be normalizing entrepreneurialism for our young people coming through the system. And we need to be good at it. We need to be equipping our spin out founders with that skill set. Now, putting that into the context of the wider uh, approach we need to take in the country, the next thing we have to do is think about the entrepreneurial ecosystem as a system. Historically, we've made lots of isolated interventions. You know, one agency's done that, the government's done this, uh, a private body's done that. But we need to coalesce around the same model of how the innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem works if we're going to reinforce mutually each other's interventions. So, for example, the Scottish Technology Ecosystem Review, which was published a couple of years ago, looked at uh, part of our innovation ecosystem, the, the, essentially the, the technology ecosystem that's kind of centre of gravity around the internet economy tech, and said, what's the system at work there? How does that work and what can we do to strengthen it so we can have, back to our questions earlier, more scaling companies, more startups, and having more success with them? And uh, there we go. Essentially, at a high level, you can view our ecosystem like this in tech. It's essentially a funnel, as I was saying earlier. Lots of small companies at the start. Funnel narrows as you go through to you know, so-called unicorn status and beyond. I'm very proud of that unicorn icon. I scoured the internet for that. And uh, you know, basically what happens is that the funnel narrows too quickly in Scotland. And the gap between the natural narrowing rate and what we're actually experiencing is, is our opportunity gap. That's where policy needs to come in to support. So what the Ecosystem Review does is it looks at the three fundamental dependencies of the, of the funnel, which are the ones you see here, and makes recommendations that uh, can strengthen those in a system sense to strengthen the output, which is more companies and more companies getting to scale. The power of having a common model is that the different parties involved, different stakeholders can coalesce around that model and work together. So to give you just one example briefly, because obviously there's a lot in that, that report, but we've recently launched, you might, might be aware of the TechScaler network, which is seven uh, essential incubation sites across Scotland, but they're combined with world-class internationally sourced founder education so that our founders actually know how to grow a company and understand how to drive virality and all these kind of concepts, just like their Silicon Valley competitors do, and that training is coming from the Silicon Valley. It also combines a kind of town square concept where we can hold all our meetups and things like that and just encourage sharing of knowledge and it creates a platform that we're now working with Scottish Enterprise, Highlands Islands Enterprise and South of Scotland Enterprise to integrate grant funding into that, that network so that when companies uh, are curated for entry into the tech scale network they're also curated for grant funding in one process so it's just a bit more efficient and, and, and useful. So that's just a kind of example of how we can start to combine uh, our infrastructures and that we can now extend that infrastructure to become a general startup scaler environment. We can combine uh, different uh, domains, etc. So for example, if you think about taking that further out, we can think about the connectedness domain. We can think about the fact that we tend to view, if I zoom in on that horizontal, it looks like this, we tend to view different technology and other domains as separate entities. We think about, for example, um, you know, tech and creative industries and life sciences as separate. But if I was to ask you, you know, is, is, is Moderna a life sciences company or a tech company? It's obviously both because it uses massive AI engines to analyze biology. Pixar, creative company or a tech company, same story. In Scotland, we tend to celebrate our life sciences but hold them in academia and not set the same expectation that, that people should be starting companies out of life sciences. In Scotland we have a strong creative sector. We have two of the best uh, uh, creative schools in the world, you know, the Conservatoire and the, the Glasgow School of Art, but we don't teach those young folks coming through there about entrepreneurialism and we don't take our life sciences people and our, our internet tech people and put them in the same environment. 
But as I'm sure everyone here knows, real innovation happens in the gaps between disciplines, not within disciplines. So if we take our tech scaler example, just to take one example, and start to integrate life sciences, creative industries in there, then you know we'll create great companies and we'll learn the value of innovating across functions and domains, which would be powerful. So there's a lot of you know sort of policy development we can do there. The other scale is or the other um, axis is scale. And we tend to talk a lot about scale-ups because that's one way to you know, drive impact and we all want to scale and that's very good and scale-ups are very valuable. I'd be the last person to say they're not. But we also need to think about scale-deeps. You know, what's a scale-deep? So scale-deep is a company that isn't going to scale beyond, say, 10 people. Um, but the scale comes from having lots of them in society, distributed from rural areas through urban areas and, and all, all in between. And why those companies are valuable is partly because their product or service directly benefits the local community that they're in, whereas scale-ups, that's not the case. So they're very, very important, but they're important in the context of today because there's a symbiosis between scale-ups and scale-deeps. Scale-ups are obviously quite inspiring. If you hear a story about a successful founder and there's very successful, very inspiring stories today, that encourages people into entrepreneurship. But you can't grow giant redwoods in the desert. So if you've got a country that isn't normalized to entrepreneurship, that doesn't have that as a normal career path for people, if you're not encouraging all those scale deeps to exist, then scale up founders aren't going to emerge from their midst. So you know, you've got to think about that forest floor. We've got to tend the forest floor as much as we focus on those shiny scale ups that we all want to, to have. So there's a lot of policy development to go here, I think, in this country. But what hopefully you can see from that is that we can use, in these difficult, straightened financial times, we can use the same emerging entrepreneurial platforms to support far more forms of entrepreneurship than we do today across far more domains if we take a systems orientation to it, which we haven't in the past done to the extent that we're starting to do. Now, what does this mean finally for universities? Well, <coughs> universities can't be great research institutions and great teaching institutions they alone, they also have to be great entrepreneurial institutions. And one of the things that, that we're working on just now that I'm very uh, keen to see uh, really get embedded in Scotland is the concept of the entrepreneurial campus. You know, I talked earlier about do, do we encourage students to start their own companies, do we give them incubation, do we give them support, grant funding, do we teach our students how to be entrepreneurial? Do we collide our technical and non-technical and design students together in startup exercises? Do we run summer schools? Do we equip or spin out founders properly? Do we take 50% equity off them before they get out the door so that we can massively disincentivize them? Or do we set a sensible level for that? These are the sort of questions we need to address at university level to create entrepreneurial campuses that will drive the exponential technologies and strengthen our overall ecosystem in Scotland. So, you know, looking forward to us doing that. And in the meantime, thanks for your time.